Uh, I have the personal belief that uh, entrepreneurs, oops, I have the personal belief that we are at the beginning of an explosion of entrepreneurs that create social and environmental positive impact. And my presentation tonight will try to show you why I believe that. So, my name is Jake Lace. I'm, I'm a global director of a program that invests essentially into hardware entrepreneurs and startups, specifically those that have a social and environmental impact, so social sectors, environmental technologies. But before I get in, I like to tell you just a little bit about myself in addition to what you just heard, because I have since... I've been doing this with entrepreneurs over the last six years, and I always had an interest in understanding what's behind many things that we take for granted. What's the underlying structure, and how can you take that structure and, and make it in such a way that it benefits others to do something with it. So that sort of was my idea, and it all started with this next image, if it ever comes. Um, Is it plugged in? Oh, it, it works. There you go. It works. Okay. So this is uh, a radio from Panasonic called the Panape uh, R70. Um, my dad had one of these. Um, and uh, I, ex I asked him one day, so how does a radio work? So you can see how old I was, um, so how old I am now. Um, but anyway, he said, well, there are little people inside this radio, and they sing, and they talk, and they play music. Uh, and so sure enough, I took a screwdriver to understand what these little men looked like. Um, well, no surprise, as you know, there are no little men inside. So I realized back then, this is, there's something behind these shells. Uh, and so that triggered this. But you also, one thing that was really interesting is um, it's sort of the demonstration of the Moore's law because the transistors that are inside, they were big, right? These were, this is really low tech in comparison to what we do today. What was interesting, um, a couple of years ago, my, when my youngest son was three years old, he said the TV was broken. So I was afraid that he took the screwdriver and unmantled the TV. But the reason why he said it was broken because when he swiped it, it would not move on to the next screen. So this is the difference between me as a child with this and our children who have literally fingertips technology um, through the apps and, and mobile devices we have today. All right. Okay, so I have three parts of my presentation. The first part is about Autodesk. Um, but mainly because I wanted to tell you why we're doing this as a company, uh, what we're doing. Um, the second part is going to be about technological trends that are very important for our customers, but that are also very important to the entrepreneurs that use these technologies to innovate great stuff, which leads to the third part, which is about the entrepreneurs themselves. So these are sort of the three parts. Um, so let's just get right into it. Um, Autodesk is a 32-year-old company. Um, I'm not going to read all this, but it is a company that makes software that helps other people to create things. Um, many, many different types of things. Um, our vision is, our corporate vision is to help people imagine, design, and create a better world. So this is really part of our DNA, and, and it's quite... The reason for that is because is if you look at these different products here, um, it's not, we don't make the car, it's our customer who makes the car. We don't create the cities or city planning or the Shanghai Tower. It's our customers who make these buildings. Um, we don't create infrastructure and plants. It's our customers who create the plants. We don't make movies, but our customers use our technology to make movies. So this is sort of the, the breadth of, of industry sectors that we have, manufacturing, the architectural space, built environment, um, and, and the media entertainment space. So 12 million users worldwide, 200 million users of our consumer products, and we 
heavily work with uh, students uh, in the engineering and design and architectural spaces and faculties worldwide as well, um, have, giving them access to free software so that they can understand how to use this tool so you can create better buildings. Okay, so the reason why we have this vision of helping people imagine design, create a better world, is because we realized if our millions of users use our tools to create the next building on car or phone in, an, uh, in, in, in a not educated, well way that takes care of what the product will be in the end, um, it will have a negative effect. Vice versa, if we do everything right, our customers can create the best built environment, the best products, and that has potentially impact on billions of people who use these tools, who use these buildings where we live and work in and so on. And when we say a better world, we actually really mean that by 2050, 10 billion people will live on this planet. We like to have 10 billion people live well and live within the means of the planet. So for us, this is a an, an, an very important part of what we do. And so why is that important? You look at um, 2050s or 10 billion people, twice as many as we have today. It also means that 75% of these people will live within a city, within an urban environment. Uh, actually, 95% will live within an hour's drive of a city. So then you consider that 5 billion of them will live in the global middle class. The requirements on energy are twice as we have today. It's not just energy, it's resources, it's water. It's the well-being and the comfortable environments of living in a building or in a city. Um, so these are all different uh, areas that we want to have some sort of influence in. Many cities are not being built yet. Many streets are not being built yet. Not in Japan, but in other areas uh, around the world. By 2020, you have 50 billion connected devices. Um, so these are not just mobile phones, but these are also sensors. Internet of Things, sensors that sit in products, and so on. So this is a tremendous technology um, that, that uh, uh, development that, that plays a big role. So I'm part of the Autodesk Sustainability and Philanthropy team. Um, we do a lot of different things, and I'm going to go into this. Um, the three most important things that we do is, number one, is um, make sure that our tools have the right sustainability uh, features so our customers can use um, these uh, tools correctly. Um, and the other two items, I get to it. So, for example, tools. When you build a building, you can do today a rapid energy analysis of a building before it's being built so you understand what the energy consumption of the building will be. Um, you, you take a building, you know where the building sits on the planet, you have the climate data of the planet, you make a you turn that building 10 degrees. You have a different sunlight reaching into the building. So that means you have different locations for your photovoltaic, your solar panels. You have different um, thermal comfort levels inside the building. So these are all things that, that you can do today to, uh, with software. It's the same thing actually for retrofitting too. Um, and then there's a couple of other things. I'm not going to mention all of this, but even with the manufacturing, how do you plan a factory? How do you manage energy um, consumption? How do you pick the right materials when you create a product that has water consumption levels low or a greenhouse gas emission footprint or a carbon footprint? So this is sort of an example. You can see this is sort of what we call um, you know, a, a whole system dynamics. If you look at the building, it's actually really complex. There are many, many different variables that uh, provide us comfort that we often don't think about, um, where the windows are, how big the windows are, how much light and how much energy goes in or goes out, and so on. So these are sort of a couple of things that now helps an architect or a developer to understand how does this building should look like so that it becomes more comfortable, that the value of the building goes up, that the energy consumption goes out, down, that the costs go down as well at the same time. Uh, so this is a, a little um, project that we have done. This is a uh, U.S. Air Force chapel in, in, uh, in the U.S. And so we scanned the entire building inside out. And then through computational fluid dynamics, we understand now 
where in which in which part of the building are the hot spots um, in which part of the building is is a, a, is uh, the lack of air ventilation or or lower and and so that gives a, a, a precise overview of how do you want to renovate this building so that you can make it more energy uh, efficient okay so i'm getting to supporting high impact customers this is where my program sits um, we look at um, entrepreneurs and innovators, the next generation of entrepreneurs and innovators. Um, and what we provide is essentially four different things. Um, number one, we provide them access to software. Um, number two, um, we provide training uh, and support and other levels of, of mentorship. We lend them our expertise if we have them in-house. We connect them with the environment. We, we bring them to uh, conferences. Maybe there's a pitching session. Um, give them exhibition space. Uh, really have them an opportunity, give them an opportunity to expose their ideas and find um, and accelerate their way. Um, and we have also the opportunity for financial support, which comes through the Autodesk Foundation, which is able to provide uh, financial grants. Um, so obviously, we can't do all of this with all of them. The, since the program that I'm running started, we have over 4,000 companies worldwide already supported with software. Um, we won't do all of this with 4,000 companies. Um, we, we look for the most impactful, the most potential for scale, and the most innovative companies um, to, to provide further levels of support. I'll go into more detail a little bit later. Um, our foundation um, is a corporate foundation that sits as corporate out of the US. These are sort of the companies that already are, or organizations, I should say, um, a lot of them are nonprofits that receive um, support from, uh, from Autodesk, uh, either with software or any other way that I showed earlier. And this is sort of a snapshot of some of the companies from last year um, that went through the Entrepreneur Impact Program. So we, we look into a number of different areas um, the most interesting and fast coming is the area around food and agriculture, um, as well as uh, mobility. But there is also often a, a split by country. Uh, in Australia, there's a lot of water, um, versus uh, in, in China, it's often air pollution and, and solar panels and, and energy, clean energy. So we are a small team. We are a global team, but we are a small team. So what we need to do um, in order to provide the best possible way of running our programs is to look for partners. And we look, partner with incubators and accelerators, with venture capital firms, with investors, um, with organizations, non-profit, uh, non-governmental organizations, with government agencies, with industry associations, and so on. And, and this is sort of a snapshot of partners that we've been working with um, last year, and some, most of them still, um, is sort of a snapshot of, along uh, many different countries um, around the world. And so the last thing I will talk about our program and the sustainability uh, itself is what we do as a company. Um, and we call that lead by example. Um, there is a... Um, a business coalition called uh, We Mean Business. This uh, coalition set seven different goals um, in the run-up to COP21 in Paris to make the point that businesses have an opportunity and I would say even a responsibility to look at seven different commitments that will help us to mitigate and overcome climate change challenges. And these ones are the seven different commitments, and uh, we announced just recently that video, the first North American company that actually fulfills all of these. We are 100% renewable um, four years in advance. Um, we do this through um, certificates, but we are in increasingly looking into renew local renewable, renewable energy resources as well. So these are all very important pieces. Um, we report them out in our sustainability report every year. Um, and, and it's an important part because we believe we can't talk about sustainability in our tools if we also don't look at it ourselves, right? So it's a software company, so our carbon footprint is not big. In comparison to a company that makes cars, our carbon footprint really is tiny. Um, nonetheless, we should go and do these things uh, regardless. 
it is also an opportunity for us to check with our tools, whether our tools can actually help us. It is an opportunity for, under, for us to understand what does a company need to do in order to go, let's say, 100% renewable, um, and how can our tools help? Um, two last points here, employee impact. So this is something that we are running as well. We invite um, our employees to participate and to volunteer. They can volunteer with their uh, preferred uh, nonprofit organization or charitable organization. And every year we run a global month of impact where we actually do something that has benefits. We work with this organization called Enable. Um, and for one day in one big office, people come together in a room like this and assemble these hands. Um, this year they went to uh, Syrian refugees' children's. Um, these hands, so this one costs about $30. Um, the reason, these are all 3D printed. We worked with them. They came to our um, uh, office, our manufacturing research uh, development center in, in San Francisco. Um, so we, we used our tools, we 3D print them, and it's a set that comes and you go and assemble them, um, and then we ship, uh, we ship them back to them and they ship it to the, the people in need. Um, the reason why these are, the 3D printing, the idea here is just that a child grows up pretty quick, right? So you, you can't invest uh, $5,000 or so into a, a professional you know, titanium prosthetics uh, if two years later he's, the hand grew bigger than that. And so these are the opportunities here with using these type of um, hands, which, which have a tremendous impact um, on, on, on children. The other thing is pro bono activities. We work with our customers, the entrepreneurs, but also with nonprofits. The Marine Mammal Center in San Francisco uh, or north of San Francisco needed a dart to tranquilize um, marine animals that they want to bring in for care. Uh, that has a sonar uh, integrated in it, and our team uh, in San Francisco helped in developing this, so they can use that. Okay, so this is part one. Um, part two is now about the technology, the, the trends that we see in the manufacturing and in other industries, and which, which have the, the opportunity for our entrepreneurs, the entrepreneurs that we work with, to use that technology development. So we call that the future of making things. It's, um, it's how the manufacturing and the build environment actually is going to change and how products are being made, how buildings are being designed. The very first thing that we realized is, is that this whole cycle of designing, making, and using is converging. Um, so I, I'm, I'm a trained product designer. I used to work for, um, as a product designer. And there was typically a brief that you get from your product manager, and then you design it, and you pass it on to the engineer, and it gets manufactured. And eventually you see it in a shop, but you will never touch it again. It, it was out of your hands. The user is using it, uh, hopefully loves it, um, but that was that. And what we see now, an increased convergence of designing and making and using. So I'll give you a couple of examples. First of all, with designing, we see a number of different changes. Um, it's no longer the ivory tower of design um, development. It is a collaborative activity that happens um, across the world. There, there are a lot more opportunities today to collaborate than, than, uh, than we had uh, 10 years ago. Uh, secondly, we see that the access to capital has become a lot easier. Uh, it's still the hardest thing. If you ask an entrepreneur what's your number one challenge, they will say funding. I need money, I need to sustain the business. But it has become a lot easier today than it has been. Um, and also the costs of making things has been going down as well. So um, Kickstarter is one thing, there's obviously crowdsourcing, there are all different types of uh, incubation models and accelerators that, that pop up everywhere. The second thing is cloud computing. Um, it essentially provides you unlimited computing power if you want to because um, it gets over the cloud. And that has an, a tremendous opportunity on, uh, gives companies a tremendous opportunity to develop the tools. Um, your mobile phone that you have in your hands or in your pocket here um, has multiple computing power than the space shuttle had. Um, and so 
the space shuttle flew up and came back. So you can imagine the, the, the actually the, the power that we have in our pockets. Um, what are we using it for? In the make space, we see a number of different things that happen as well. So a lot of the architectural space is actually becoming prefabrication. There's a lot of manufacturing aspects that happen there. Um, you see micro factories pop up. The opportunity to do low batch production is a lot easier today than it was ever before. Um, and, and this is an interesting example. These earphones are tailored, customized earphones for your ear, um, not for the ear of your friend, but for your ear. So these are opportunities to, uh, to see where you see customization and personalization playing a tremendous role today with, with, uh, with many companies that make products. So in the use space, uh, the digital and the, the physical world are more and more converging as well. Um, we, the sensors that go into products um, can tell a story on how the product is being used when it breaks down, but also what needs to be improved the next time around you create a product. Um, everybody of you has Google Maps. There are apps that give you the idea of don't go into this road because there are many cars standing there. It's because the, the phone that tells the map that stands there, um, it's, it's an opportunity to see whether there's a traffic jam. Um, and then this is a screenshot from the Tesla on the left side. So you wake up and you get into your car next morning, there's a software download and it's a new car or a modified car. So these interfacings between you with our products is changing as well. So if you look at all of this, because there is this convergence of make, use, and, uh, and design, you also see different types of um, collaborative activities uh, jumping, coming up, and more and more uh, interesting developments with regards to how companies make products. It used to be that you have, that innovation would trickle down. I think these days we see more and more uh, innovation tricking, uh, trickling up. Okay. The area of documentation, so this is a long time ago when we used 2D drawings um, just to document and how things are done. Um, the area of, optim of optimization, that's also passé. That's when you had an understanding of this is how it fits together. Um, and today we are in the area of connections where you can sit at your breakfast table and review what your project actually is doing and how well it's, it's, it's happening because of the computational power. Um, the manufacturing processes are changing, um, and you can actually, as I said earlier, in include sensors into products that give you then an idea on how to produce and create the next version of it. Yeah, design teams are changing. I'm going to go into a couple of things. Um, uh, typically, when you look into productivity, what typically companies would do, they would um, ensure that the input um, the costs are low and the outputs are um, just in time manufacturing. These are all things that can easily be replicated and it does no longer give you the opportunity of differentiation. The same thing with innovation. Even if you create a new design today, it maybe takes a couple of months or weeks if you're lucky and somebody else is following you through. Um, and processes are changing in manufacturing. This is the fuselage of the A350. Um, um, produce, produced with carbon fiber. But even with processes, these are things that can relatively quickly be replicated. Um, so there are a few disruptive trends um, that I believe could be um, of interest. In, this, in a way, a lot of these disruptive trends can also help some of the, the companies produce their products. So these are three different parts, production, demand, and products. Um, the production Essentially, um, what we see is different types of production means and, and how it's being done. I'll give you a quick example. So this is a chair on the left side, um, as you probably would, um, you know, if you tell a designer, I, I need a chair that holds a 70 kilogram person, um, make it as minimal as possible in the sense of use as minimum amount of material. Um, the chair on the right is not designed by a person, but an algorithm. And so the same criteria was given into software, and they say, can you make a chair that is 
has the least amount of material but holds a 70 kilogram person. And you can see the difference. So this is um, what we call generative, generative design. And here's a good example. So next time you fly in an, air, in, in, in a plane, you see the, the, the divider between um, the various different classes. Um, typically, these materials are used um, uh, either aluminum or steel reinforced. And we've done a project with um, Airbus where we basically gave these criteria into the, the algorithm, uh, into the software, um, and came up with these three different parts. Um, you can see this part here on the right side in a, in a close-up. This would be really hard to manufacture because you have a lattice uh, structure that you can't um, weld. Um, this is a special alloy made from aluminum, magnesium, and scantium um, that uh, Airbus did specifically for this. And they 3D print this. Um, and by using this material and using this generatively designed um, panel, they're able to reduce the weight by 40% or 45%, which saves um, several hundred thousands of metric tons of CO2 every year. And, and of course, weight and fuel because of that. So you see this is already something um, that's happening. This, this panel is currently in the tests um, to with, uh, before it gets approved and moved into, um, into the actual commercial air, uh, planes. Um, Under Armour, we did a, a little project with them. The, the lattice structure on the back heel is something that you can't produce with injection molding because it's an intertwined lattice uh, designed uh, generatively through the software in order to give maximum strength. Um, again, this is something that was um, used with 3D printing. And so this is another interesting thing is um, there's a company, uh, this is a research project, a company in California called Bandido Brothers. They do all sorts of crazy cars. Um, they started to do this uh, chassis here on the right upper corner um, and then let a, a driver drive it around the track hundreds of times while there is uh, hundreds of sensors inside the, the structure. The sensors then pick up where the most stresses are and that was backfed into the software creating a structure that you can see on the bottom right corner that no engineer would come up with. This is truly not possible to design something like this um, uh, in the same way. So the this, you feed in what material you use, what manufacturing process you want to use, what cost limitations you have, where, what functional standards you need, what performances you need, and the software basically does the rest. And then and last example is a company out of Amsterdam, uh, DX3X, I think it's called. They make, they will produce this bridge in Amsterdam over the canal. It's going to be eight meters long, and it prints itself. So there are, on each side, four, six axis robotic arms that print a, a steel alloy while it's basically starting from the right and to the left, and they will meet eventually in the middle. Um, and so it's a real-time feed feedback loop that feeds the decision on where to put the next piece of material to, in order to make something that's not just stable, but also looks pretty. Um, all right, so this is Denise Schindler, uh, Schindler a Paralympian currently in Rio at the Paralympics. I don't know, these two people there. Um, uh, and uh, our senior vice president in Europe. So we've worked with um, Denise and create a prosthetics for her leg that prepared her. She is a um, national champion. She did, I think, a bronze medal in, in London. Um, a prosthetics for her typically take, is handmade. Um, it takes a long time. And now you can print one in five days at the quarter of the costs. So it's sort of a, 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 a put, put, um, how do you say, a, um, a put, um, demonstration project to understand what materials you can use in order to uh, enable her. All right, I mentioned sensors. Um, the sensors are everywhere, um, and, and, and they feed back to our products. Um, uh, consumer demand is growing as, uh, is, is growing as well, and the expectations of consumer demand is changing. Um, customers like to see, where does the product, where is the product manufactured? 
that becomes important. Um, has the company paid attention to sustainability issues? Um, that is also becoming important. Um, it's aesthetics, of course, as well. Um, it's no longer sort of the price. I remember when um, Steve Ballmer um, was talking about the iPhone, I said, well, that's not going to work. Who's going to buy a $700 iPhone, right? And, and today we use iPhones. That is, the price is no longer the most important thing, especially for the new generation of consumers, the millennials. They, will, they want to see a lot more than just a product that has a function. That's the function is implied. Okay, so now I get to the entrepreneurs. Um, and I have a couple of um, statistics first before I show you a couple of examples. I have, I think, a total of six examples. Um, key drivers of, of entrepreneurs worldwide is typically um, a couple of things. So I have four things here, one of five, something like that. Um, the awareness has risen. So if you are anywhere in the world and you have access to internet, which is increasingly um, the case, um, you have an awareness of what's happening around the world. But you also have the opportunity to build around the world. There are entrepreneurs who create products in Germany and have it manufactured in India and tested in Singapore uh, and, and so on. So you, you see many different types of different inter um, country based connections. Um, the other thing is, as I said earlier, access to capital is easier, computing power is easier. Um, but the other thing is that, two other things is we see an increased challenge to our systems, the systems that we know. Um, and in many countries, there are systems that are not set up. Um, there are many communities that are off grid and will probably never e become on grid they, in, in terms of electricity, just like. Um, never will get a hard line, telephone line, and stay mobile. Um, but a lot of countries also see entrepreneurship and innovation as a way to build the next consumer and the next market, the next companies, the next businesses, a way of developing the economics for the future um, out of the necessity that they have on the ground. There are many countries where you have social environmental necessities, problems, and challenges. Um, and people are, don't wait for the big companies to solve it or for the government. They go and take their, hands, um, their own hands and, and create something. Um, population, of course, is something that, is, uh, that we've been looking at. The, the, the uh, elliptical circle there around Asia, today you have already uh, more people live within that circle than you live, than live outside of it. But Africa is an up-and-coming uh, population uh, growth, we'll see in the up and coming population growth as well, which you can see in this chart. Um, you can see China actually being reduced. So in only two years, I heard uh, India, there will be more people in India than in China. Um, so they will have an age um, problem. And you can see how dark the map is for Africa. So the increase in population there will become big. Um, I saw a presentation of the um, Institute of Global Policy in Hong Kong University um, of Science and Technology. They have a new um, institute there. And the, the person, uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Jackson, I think was his name. I, my apologies if I got that wrong. That's for the camera, not for you. <laughs> um, uh, he said, this is the century of Africa um, because there is the most growth happening. It's also the, the area where you have the most challenges in terms of infrastructure, in terms of education, uh, and so on. And a lot of these countries, um, well, I shouldn't say a lot, uh, but many countries already start to realize um, that something has to be done. This is sort of another chart. I'm not going to go too much into detail. Two thirds of the global middle class will be in Asia by 2030. Um, so you will have. Um, and a tremendous growth when it comes to consumer spending. Um, and, and I don't think we need, um, what is that, $32 trillion in products that you throw away the next day. That's not a good, I don't think that's a good idea. Um, so this is, a, this is an emerging thing that is coming, whether we like it or not, it's, it's, it's on the way. So we will have to go and deal with these things. 
Um, and then the other thing, the last thing before I get into entrepreneurs is because a lot of these entrepreneurs are millennials, um, Generation C or Generation Alpha as they call the next one. Um, and they have a very specific interest. They like to see, um, as you can read here, that the company that they're buying a product from um, also has an impact, a positive impact on the community. There is this idea of profit with purpose um, and not just profit as well. Um, the issues of sustainability is important. Um, and this is from the Ernest and Young Entrepreneur Survey from 2015, which I find particularly interesting. Is um, They titled it Doing Well by the Young. You can see 34% of entrepreneurs are mentoring young people. 58% do this in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, China, China, Sub-Saharan Africa in terms of providing internships, um, working with schools, and providing guidance to young people. Um, so this is, this is interesting. It's interesting that that's, there is a lot of interest to provide something for the next generation of innovators or the next generation of consumers even, um, the next generation of the workforce. From the same um, research, the top three reasons of starting a business, um, and th so this is all young entrepreneurs, is, well, belief behind a positive economic legacy, but number two and three, make a positive contribution to wider community and inspire others to follow their, uh, in their aspirations. If you look at the left side, um, there is no United Way Silicon Valley there. It's, it's lower down. I mean, what my point here is that I think a lot of these countries, um, you have a generation of young people who see these challenges and they don't want to wait. They want to do, and because the access to technology is easier today, they can. Yeah, so Africa and Latin America leading in early stage entrepreneurship. And, and I like to show this, this is the UN um, uh, Global Impact Sustainability Goals because a lot of these goals are also aligned with um, what entrepreneurs are doing. Um, entrepreneurs who work in a country where water is a challenge most likely work on a water challenge. And that is also the country's challenge um, as, as um, measured through these goals, 17 different goals. Okay. And so this is why we do this. We believe that these entrepreneurs are the next generation of companies. And, and we believe that there is an opportunity for them to really do something right. Um, the program works like this. Um, if you are a small company, you're pre-revenue. Uh, most of them are pre-revenue. Um, less than 10 people, less than five people, uh, five years old. You can apply and you receive um, up to five licenses of our product design collection. That is a tool set of, of, um, that provides everything from design to manufacturing. Um, five, up to five seats for three years or up to $150,000 worth in value. So this is the, the basic entry level of what we do with these companies. Um, and we look, as I said earlier, at the number of different things. Um, these are on the right side, you see these are sort of the areas that we look at in terms of sectors, anything from the clean environmental technologies to social uh, um, uh, impact uh, technology solutions as well. We look at early stage, um, yeah, seed stage, angel stage, um, and, and we have a program that is active um, worldwide um, with Africa being the next frontier for us. Okay, so now I get to examples, and I think this is the most exciting bit. Um, and I like to jump right into this. This is a company, this is a, a, a person who one day decided he needs to do something better. He's, um, I believe, about 10 years younger than me, and he decided to build this lamp, or design and build this lamp. Um, and he works with the National Women's Foundation in China um, to distribute these lamps. This is a lamp that basically um, is it's given to children. Um, so the, the LED light is made in such a way that it doesn't, uh, isn't too damaging on the eyes. So it's not the cheapest LED. It's, uh, it's an expensive LED because of a certain range. 
Um, it has a um, life cycle of six years, six to seven years. Um, it's waterproof, and um, and it's often used as a as a torch as well. So what they do is they bring these. The, the National Women's Foundation recognizes here as a village. There are 200 children. Um, they need this. They call this guy, and the guy sets up a crowdsourcing site, makes advertising for the crowdfunding, not crowdsourcing, for crowdfunding site. And then when he has enough capital to make and distribute and ship and go there, then he makes them. So he calls up his manufacturer in South China and said, I need 200 pieces. They send it. And then he goes with volunteers, goes to the village, and distributes them. They go into classrooms. And it's the National Women's Foundation, but they give the, chil the children the light, not the women, because the, 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 the boy or the girl becomes the carrier of light inside the house. It's not just for homework. It's also because there is no other light inside the house. So the child helps the grandmother or lights the way to go to the, uh, the, 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 out, the, the, rest, the rest of the toilet. They received a letter here from one of the children that they supported. And I don't read Chinese, some of you may. But it essentially says, when I grow up, I want to do what you did. And so this is a, a really cool way of, of confirming back to him what I'm doing is really right thing. It's a social business. Um, and it's, I, I find it a, an, an amazing story. Here's another interesting story. I went to this company that is in uh, south of Munich. They make. Um, these turbines, smart hydropower. Um, these turbines are about one half meters in, in diameter. They're submerged into the river system in Latin America because the flow of the river is, is fast enough to power this turbine. And you can see how they do this. They used the, the little boats and, and bamboo and bring it in. It has a protective net so crocodiles don't go in and fish don't get chopped off. Um, and it has a boy on the top so people can see where it is. And, a, a, um, and it's connected to this little hut that has solar power on top. And then it feeds an entire village of 28 families. Um, so what it does is it's clean energy. It's always on because the river always flows. Um, and it's, you don't need diesel generators anymore. anymore. You don't need uh, f uh, wood burning, black carbon fires. Um, and and it's, it has a big impact. Another big impact, um, BioLight, um, a company out of the US. So every year there are four million premature deaths of, of people who um, die because of smoke inhalation. Um, they created this um, home stove. It's a stove that requires 90% less of fuel, of wood, to burn. Um, and they used our software with computational fluid dynamics to, they actually put in a turbine, a small little fan, in order to heat up so it creates a lot of heat. But at the same time, it actually creates energy because this fan spins. And so it comes with a USB plug. So you can plug in the light, you can charge your phone. Um, and uh, I think it's been... 40,000 people or so have been using it already, so offsetting again uh, black carbon, offsetting carbon. They have a, a model, a very interesting business model. It's called parallel innovation because you can buy this one. This is the, uh, the, the that you can buy. If you want to go camping, you go to biolight.com, you buy this one. I think it costs $80. Um, it's that small. It has the same functionality. Um, it, it can help you for going camping. Um, and you can charge your phone with this as well. But what's interesting is what they sell commercially supports the development of the home stove that goes into sub-Saharan Africa through support organizations that they have on the ground. This is a Chinese company, which um, I met them uh, just very shortly after they, they started their business, um, who took a patent of a flexible solar panel and make um, various different types of products using um, these flexible panels. They do educational products for, um, for schools, the little remote control car for kids to understand how technology works, how electricity works. Um, these little um, 
aircraft, um, and they do bags and, and other mobile devices which you can bring, uh, unfold, and charge your phone with. Um, they went to a school, um, and one of the uh, journalists went with them and outfitted a school with solar panels and provided basically consistent energy um, for the school, um, which again was a big impact as well. Fertility is a company that is uh, headquartered out of Singapore and Hamburg. They do a three-wheeled uh, zero-emission solar power scooter. This is essentially the same technology as your toddler's uh, daughter or son are using, um, so it's very stable. Um, but what's interesting in the idea is it's the same thing as bike share. So you would go and rent one and bring it back. Um, and it's the idea of overcoming the last mile, which is often a problem. Um, the last mile meaning from your home to the train station uh, or from, from your office to the train station, um, which is very easily, if it's hot and humid, then you take a taxi. But you sh actually, you don't have to. Right? This is a, a nice way. They're currently testing this in Hamburg um, as well as in Singapore. Vantage Power, they replace, uh, they have a project currently running where they replace diesel engines in buses in London with hybrid engines. Um, and uh, at the fractions of a cost of what a hybrid bus would cost like, would cost. Um, again, here's the, uh, the opportunity to create cleaner transportation in cities relatively easily, relatively cheaply. Uh, Proximity Design is a company um, a non-profit organization that creates a solar-powered irrigation system. If you are a farmer, you walk, you irrigate, and you repeat. And there's a lot of time spent in just doing this. This is a solar-powered irrigation system. It frees up the time for farmers. It gives them the opportunities to do other types of businesses. Um, in the 10 years that uh, Proximity Design has been doing this, um, they've been... Um, affecting uh, over 2 million people in, in Myanmar. I think they cover 80% of, of the rural Myanmar. Um, so they use uh, you know, human-centered design to understand how does this product need to look like, what, how does it need to work, how can it affect and should it affect the, the, the life of farmers. DREF is an interesting company as well. Um, they produce a, a knee prosthetics um, a artificial knee, 165 degree, you know, again, the same story as with the hand. If you, uh, if, if somebody requires this in the United States, it's titanium and different alloys and it's $20,000. And so this is a fraction of the cost and giving um, people in, this is in a picture from uh, a girl who lost her leg in, an, in a motorcycle accident, um, being able to uh, have proper ways of, of working um, of working because she can walk um, without a cane and without uh, having a deformed spine after 20 years of, of walking without legs. And then um, finally, Mass Design. This is uh, an organization that builds uh, hospitals in Rwanda. This is the Butau Hospital in Rwanda. It's specifically designed in such a way that it has a high ventilation flow. Um, it is um, designed in a way that it um, uh, produces environments where people heal faster. Um, at the same time, they worked with the community to build this, gave 3,500 people jobs at the same time, and also taught them on how to do and build these things. So these are all examples of companies and entrepreneurs and nonprofits that use these tools but also, they use our tools, and we are happy about supporting them, but what more importantly, they use and leverage these developments and trends that I explained earlier. Um, and, and as I said at the beginning, I believe that we are ready to see a lot more um, of these things. Um, if you're interested, um, there are seven other stories on the uh, Asia Pacific um, magazine, uh, ecobusiness.com. Um, we have seven other stories. Um, these ones are um, important. I think there's an important lesson to learn out of this. I believe that if you really want to make a difference as a hardware startup, you actually can. You can really leverage um, a lot more today than you could do um, only a couple of years ago, 10 years ago. 
Um, and yeah, I, I leave you with that. That's really all that I have. Um, I hope that was inspiring and interesting. And I think we move on to a Q&A as well. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jake. It's a pleasure having you here. Thank you. Great. Thanks. What about an amazing presentation, guys? Fantastic. Uh, very visual, very uh, impactful. Um, what is sustainability? It's one of these buzzwords like digital. Uh, everybody talks, everybody's talking about it, but really it's difficult to understand. What the heck does sustainability mean? Yeah, I, uh, so I'm German. Uh, I like the German word for sustainability much better than sustainability. Uh, it's uh, Nachhaltigkeit. Um, and um, if I explain that word, it actually means, Haltigkeit means when you preserve something. And Nach, that little prefix means you want to preserve it for later on. Um, I, I forgot who that said. Um, I should look this up. I just remember it now. Somebody said sustainability is actually a terrible word. Right? If I ask you how is your marriage going and you say sustainable, it's not good. That's not a, <laughs> that's not a good way of describing this. But if it's nachhaltig, I think it has a future. So, I mean, that's maybe a little bit of um, a, a sidetrack here. Sustainability generally describes the um, the the actions that we can undertake, each one of us, whether individually or as a as, as company or organizations, that will not only sustain our world, but actually also leaves it behind for our next generations. Um, and, and as I said earlier, specifically as we have these challenges of, of 10 billion people, um, we have to work on that. What does it have to do with CSR, if anything? Um, so CSR, corporate social responsibility, uh, the, the corporate responsibility often covers sustainability in the sense that when you look at sustainability as a means of risk mitigation, um, for example, you, you don't want to pollute the river next to your factory, um, so you, you pay attention to this. But that's really mi risk mitigation. It's, it's not just doing good, it's, uh, you also want to do better. Um, I'm, I typically would say that CSR is, is an activity that is often driven by boards. Um, uh, and and when, it's, when, when you have sustainability part of your culture and part of the DNA, um, you probably don't need a CSR department. Because the, you would automatically start and look into creating products or environments um, for your employees, but also for your consumers, for every touch point of your brand that you go out um, and reach um, the world, really, in a, in a sustainable way. So in that case, if I was one of the ventures, uh, my starting point actually would be one of sustainability in the context of what you presented. Whereas from Autodesk's perspective, this program mm. that you're running, in fact, is a CSR program that happens to have a sustainability theme. Is that right? Is that the way to look at it? So, uh, so with regards to entrepreneurs, I think a lot of them start thinking, I think there's an opportunity here for me to write, to do an innovation that I can build a business with that uh, provides clean energy, for example. I don't think entrepreneurs go and say, I think it will do a sustainable company. Mm. I think these days, it becomes part of, automatically part, especially in areas where they have challenges, they will go and start do them uh, to counter them. Um, we've done with our program a very deliberate focus uh, on, on, on supporting entrepreneurs with a social and environmental impact because it is part of our vision. Um, and so I, I never really perceived it as a CSR project, but I guess you could, right, because we, it's a software grant, and it's other types of investments that we do into these companies without a hook or without an, uh, in, in, in equity or without uh, expectations that, that they buy from us. It's not uh, that specifically, yeah. Mm -hmm. Some people may see uh, the economics of sustainability at, or I should say sustainability at odds with profitability. What are the economics of sustainability? Do I have to be less profitable uh, in order to be more humane? No, no, I think, uh, I, I think it's quite the opposite. Um, 
the sustainability index of FTSE London, I think, is a good example. It, it actually showed it outperforms the FTSE. Um, so the other thing is, for example, if you put a price on carbon, um, well, sooner or later it will come. So it's an opportunity for you to get on board now rather than waiting until a law dictates you to do it. Mm. So it is an opportunity for many companies to become closer connected to their consumers. Uh, it creates a better positive image brand positioning because you don't greenwash. You actually go and say, we do this and we create this product and we take extra care that it is produced in a sustainable way, um, that it's when it's disposed, um, it can be recycled and so on, right? So these are all important touch point, especially for the incoming new group of consumers who pay attention to this. Mm. Uh, as I've shown earlier, right, the millennials and, and the ones that come after, mm. they, they pay attention to this. My, my son told me, uh, he scolded me for leaving the water running when I brushed my teeth. He said, you're wasting water. Mm. And, and so I asked him, where did you learn this? Well, in school. Mm. And it was, not, it was not be sustainable. It was, hey, this is not necessary. Right? Mm. So it, this, this um, conscious of, of um, resources, we will see that a lot more. Um, and there's a lot of companies already have to deal with this. I mean, the reason why Airbus is doing what I showed earlier is, is also because it gives them a competitive edge if their planes produce less carbon mm. because it uses less fuel. Mm. Mm. So there's a, there's a, it's a multi, it's a, it's a multi uh, party issue. It's just, actually the whole issue of climate change is very complex and systemic. And it's not that uh, you or the company can do this by yourself. It's companies together and countries and the general public in general need to be active there. Mm. To what extent is uh, government policy influencing this? You listed the top 10 UN priorities for sustainability. Yeah. Uh, to what extent is it being politically driven? Political agendas are on the table. So uh, policies do have a role to play. Uh, in, in now it's you look at countries that have that are relatively high on the innovation index. It's often because the countries, the governments of the countries, drive that. Um, and and similarly with companies who understand that they see that as an opportunity to build a strong economy. Mm. It becomes it becomes sort of a competitive edge. Um, I, I've I've we've done a report on Latin America and Chile came on, uh, out on top in terms of its commitment to support entrepreneurs that have uh, this drive. Um, and it's interesting, um, you, you see a lot of these companies in Africa, it's Kenya that's playing a big role. Um, in China, the five-year plan, it is the last five-year plan, the current five-year plan, all points to innovation, to clean air, to um, uh, uh, you know, weaning off fossil fuel and in, in introducing renewable energy. And they don't do this because, you know, there is, they felt like it was the right thing to do. They, they do it also because it's, you know, in some extent it's a service to back to the country, mm. to the communities, mm. um, and it is a way of making it competitively. Mm. Um, and uh, I, I believe that every country should actually pay attention to this. Mm. Yeah. How would you answer a guy like Friedman who would say a company's social, only social responsibility is to use resources in an optimum way uh, to maximize profits, and as long as it plays within the rules mm. of the game. And it's the citizen's responsibility in his private capacity to do these kind of things. And in fact, by not doing it, mm. the company is suboptimal in its performance. It's not utilizing resources as it should. And it, in fact, will not raise the overall GDP and prosperity of the people around it and in the community. How would you answer that? Are they at conflict with each other or, or not? Well, I would say I believe, the, I believe there isn't really such a very strict division anymore between private and business because of how the technology has changed and how we use our tools today. 
um, it's no longer that big gap that it maybe used to be. Um, I mean, at the beginning of the 19th, 20th century, design was a way of making something look good so people buy it. Mm. Um, I mean, I'm simplifying. There were plenty of people who did amazing stuff. But, but there was for a long time the idea, well, there, here is a, we do the right thing. We make a product aesthetically look good and function well, and people will buy it, mm. and it will serve them well. Um, but today, you look at design companies, they submerge themselves within the consumer. They spend a week with a family in India mm. to understand how are they using this tool that I'm now going to design the next version of. Mm. And, and so by implanting yourself there, you no longer have that really strict divide between what's private. I mean, of course, it's a private home, mm. but the, the overlaps are um, much more complicated these mm. days. I think we see, a, as I said, sort of a convergence of, of all of this. Um, and, and then the last thing I would answer is, I know a lot of entrepreneurs who believe profit with purpose is a way forward. And, and it's, they're not doing this because I mean, often they're doing this also because they see it's, it's a value that they leave behind, an impact that they leave behind. It makes them feel good. Um, like this, the, the, the gentleman who makes these lamp, when he had that letter, that was impactful. He yeah. said, wow, this is great. I, it's a recognition for him, and it made him feel good. It makes me feel good hearing about it. Yeah. Um, and I think that's, that's, that would be my answer. I think there is a, there is a different way forward. forward. Mm. There's a lot of trepidation uh, and has been for a number of years in clean tech or green tech, um, yeah. biomass, fuels, solar, wind, uh, and so on. Has any of that uh, uh, hesitation spilled over into the kind of ventures and, uh, that you're seeing, the entrepreneurs who you're talking to? Yeah, I think you always have, you know, clean tech was a good example of the hype cycle. Yeah where it went up and down and then sort of matured now. Um, and, and I think you will see this in, in any new development. You will see that with VR and, and, and or virtual reality or 3D printing. And these sort of things always go through hype cycles. Um, but I believe that maybe the hype cycles also become shorter, mm -hmm. the, which, it, of course, it depends on the technology, but it will give the opportunity to learn quicker as well. Mm -hmm. um, and. So far, I haven't seen, I haven't seen, maybe there's sort of a hype with social entrepreneurship. Uh, it has become an impact, right? That's sort of a word that you hear more often. Um, in the end, I believe maybe we one day don't have sustainability because everything will be sustainable. Mm. Uh, give you an example. So I went to the supermarket in Hong Kong um, and they had organic cucumbers. And next, they taken the Ch Chinese translation instead of saying non-organic. It's oh, sorry, sorry, it was the opposite. Um, the organic ones had a direct translation from Chinese into English, and it was non-toxic. Mm. Non-toxic cucumbers and cucumbers. Well, which one are we going to get? Mm. Right. So, shouldn't these cucumbers be non-toxic too? Mm. So, I think in the end, we'll, we'll, we realize that we do a lot of things that had unintended consequences that we didn't think about because we didn't know and because we had other priorities. And I think these priorities are changing. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we'll come to, a, I believe eventually we'll come to a point where we do have just non-toxic cucumbers. Mm. To what extent are these ventures in environments, regulatory environments, uh, countries, and so forth, in which, uh, well, for example, you and I start a venture uh, to, um, uh, promote clean water yeah. or, or, or filter water yeah. in a certain area. Yeah. And we start to catch on, we're making profits, but our country or region doesn't have the legal infrastructure, it's corrupt. I mean, everything is basically mm. stacked up against us yeah. in terms of making a proper, living, breathing, profitable enterprise. Yeah. Uh, what would we do? Yeah. We move to the next country. Uh, but how many how many countries can you move to insofar as this is not an isolated yes, situation, so, right? Yeah, I guess my point was um, I don't think you see this type of venture building up successfully in the countries that don't provide the right level of support levels uh, and the infrastructure. Um, 
that I think that plays a role. You, 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 I think that will play a role. There, there are, um, you know, there is uh, Mary's innovation competitive, global competitive levels and so on that, that look into these um, things. Um, and if you're in a country where you don't have, I mean, not even looking into clean water or any of sustainable issue, if you're in a country where it's not good to start a business because corruption levels are high and people rip you off and people steal your idea, you wouldn't even start, full stop, whatever it is, right? And so it is dependent on, it goes back to governments setting up a right level of infrastructure or have a national incubator or have um, subsidies that help entrepreneurs, uh, office space, shared office space. I mean, all these sort of things. Sometimes it's a central government that drives this and sometimes the government, central government doesn't do anything. It's regional or it's in the cities. Sometimes it's just driven by businesses and support organizations. So there are many different ways, but if, it, if this doesn't exist, it's very hard to do. Yeah. To what extent is uh, the government, wherever one may be operating, uh, a helper or a hindrance with respect to entrepreneurial activities? Many programs are very well intended, mm. grants and agencies and support, but uh, there are so many conditions and uh, bureaucratic requirements associated with it, and these are often written by academicians yeah. and bureaucrats who think they know what business is about, but have absolutely no experience, and it winds up being harmful. In your experience mm. traveling the world, talking to entrepreneurs, seeing these kinds of ventures, to what extent are the local government programs helping or hindering entrepreneurial activity in the sustainable area? Um, they can have a very, very big role to play. Um, if you have uh, a government or a city government, for that matter, um, that says we want to make it easier for people to start a business. Um, we'll give out funds, we organize VCs, venture capital, um, to, to come in. There's an annual conference that we organize. I mean, if all of this is there, it's a lot easier. Because then you basically just jump into that ecosystem uh, as an entrepreneur and start using it. Um, and, and these are the, I believe these are the sort of the countries that that, that flourish with this. Um, it, it is a little different also, sometimes the cultural aspect also has a role to play. Right? So if you, are a, if you are in a culture where entrepreneurs don't have a long history, it's a lot harder, even if the support system is there, because you need to first um, make sure that people understand there is real opportunity. Go and try it, especially when you're young. Not when you're 55, it's difficult. Um, Depends, right? It's a different. It's a different set of, of starting points, mm -hmm. um, and uh, that would be my advice. I, I mean, you see, um, uh, young under you know, teens starting businesses already, um, and I think that's the right thing to do. Get get your feet wet early. Um, um, but uh, yeah, to come back to your question, yes, I think that makes a difference. If, if, the, if the government support this, it makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. I'd like to move on from uh, the premise of sustainable ventures into how can we get involved yeah. and uh, where are the opportunities in your global travels? Where are some of the hot spots? Yeah, so um, uh, we are active quite a bit in China. Um, that has a role because because of the, the, the support that the central government is, is building there. There are maker spaces, um, so areas where people can come in and use prototyping machines um, popping up um, very quickly. Um, I th uh, so so US, the US uh, is, is very active. There is a lot there. Um, you see uh, uh, quite a few of these organizations who work and develop their solutions there and then have operations uh, like in Sub-Saharan Africa or in South America. Um, in, in Germany, you, you see more and more of that. Um, Singapore has been driving a lot, but it's a lot smaller, it's a much smaller scale. Um, uh, in India, I believe there is an initiative that the government is called the Startup India, Make in India. Um, these are sort of the 
a push towards young people go and think about how that it is possible to do, and, and um, I, I believe there is more coming from there. Um, and then in, in Africa, probably is a, a couple of countries that, that already are very active and, and have um, generally with governance and overall um, doing the right things there as well. Um, it, it is, it sometimes is also a little bit of an up and down. When the government changes and they have a completely different focus, then it goes away. Uh, I think Australia had um, a little bit of that. Mm. Um, there was a lot of push with the previous government and and um, and that has sort of gone away a little bit. So there's become a lot more well, grassroots they have to do and organize themselves. Mm. Um, so it's, it changes. Um, of course, you know, it's, I, 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 Chile is a, would be a good place. Um, I think that's an interesting area too, um, so far from what we've seen. Um, but I, I, it's, it's kind of hard for me. Um, I think in, in Europe, you generally have an interest um, in, in developing. There's a lot more. And it often starts actually from universities. Some universities have an incubator um, on campus um, that wants to nourish this as well. They have entrepreneur classes. And, and then maybe it's connected to a makerspace where people can go and start doing things as well. Um, that's, that often plays a role as well. Mm. What are some of the uh, pitfalls that you see uh, among entrepreneurs? For example, these are very complicated business activities. Mm. Uh, I have this wonderful technology and I live in Norway and it's going to do something, grow more rice or yeah. make cleaner water yeah. in a developing country, but different language, different culture, it's 6,000 miles away, uh, regulatory environment, et cetera, et cetera. It's a very, very complex proposition, even for a you know, 40 year old company like Autodesk to do, let alone an entrepreneur with limited resources. Yeah. What are some of the pitfalls you see? Yeah, for a startup, the most important thing is the connection. I, I think that's, that's key um, in terms of, I mean, manufacturing and all has become easier, but there's still a lot of um, pitfalls of not picking the right manufacturer for your product. Um, or missing deadlines because of the manufacturer not being able or because the shipping company. I mean, th these in between, these really, really small steps often are the hardest. They, they seem to be easy, but it's still something that needs to be, you need to be att pay attention to. It's great to go and do a prototype, a working prototype of your idea in that little incubator that you work in. But once it comes to production, that's, that's hard. And, and it's important to connect um, with other entrepreneurs, with other companies, and maybe even with other corporates, because sometimes, um, I, I'm, you know, especially in Europe, in London, in Paris, you read of corporate incubators and accelerators, the idea of big companies knowing that they are too big to come quickly to a disruptive innovation, outsource that through a corporate incubator. Um, or maybe take a stake into a small company and, and help them, and support them. Um, and then if it becomes big enough, absorb it back into the company. Um, I think that's, that, is, um, that is also something that we now and then see. Um, it's, still a, it's still not easy running a company, starting a company, right? There is, um, I think globally, the, the, the average is two thirds who don't make it, right? So that is, uh, um, that's tough, but I also know entrepreneurs who are doing it for the fifth time, and this time it's it really works. Um, it's it's hard, right? I mean, it's um, I'm, I'm I'm not I haven't started a company, so I can't really quite comment on that. But um, it's it's hard. It's not easy. Um, and and what the most successful tell me is connection, connection, connection. Know people who know people, so that when you come into a country, you know somebody who can guide you to the right investor or the right partner on the ground, the right manufacturer, um, or you collaborate with other people. And does your program help with some of that? Yeah, so what we do is we um, do um, either sponsor or networking activities at, at, uh, at, at partners or we work with partners. Um, we also give some of these entrepreneurs speaking opportunities. So when we uh, go attend an event and we become a, 
a sponsor of the event, then we give companies also the opportunity to present. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes there are organizations that do pitching sessions that invite us, and then we pick out um, who is in that country or in that region to go to the pitching session mm -hmm. and have the opportunity to pitch their idea, mm -hmm. and hopefully they find somebody in the, in the audience. So we try to do that as well, yes. Mm -hmm. And in seeing all these ventures, which ones are the ones that are really getting traction? Are the, the ones that are focusing on a domestic market or they have a product that they want to push out overseas? Uh, or net, net is the same? Uh, all of the above. All it's, of the above. It's, it depends a little bit. Um, in, in a particular country, you have different types of needs. Yeah. Um, so I, I couldn't say it's water or renewable energy or... I think what what is I mentioned that earlier. What is coming is a little bit sort of what's related to food security, mm. um, agricultural things, Internet of Things. So if you have sensors in your product that collect data, that aggregate data that you can use to um, to build an intelligence about something, for example, the traffic in the city or so. Mm. Um, then you have an extra edge because you, you build more than just a product. Mm. You build something that connects to an ecosystem. Mm. And I think that would be something that I, that I believe would probably have the biggest opportunity when it connects into the, the existing ecosystem um, and it connects well and it delivers the right type of data back to the user or the company, mm. uh, then, you have, then you have a good hook. Mm. Yeah. For the uh, entrepreneur who's starting out, um, what should they be thinking of? Should they be thinking of the you know typical canonical questions of business? Who's my customer? What is his issue? Do I have a product or service that addresses the issue better than the competitors? And if all those boxes are checked, sustainability is another checkbox? Or do they put sustainability right at the beginning? So if you put sustainability right at the beginning, I think you already have a, a an advantage. Uh, also, you have a field with plenty of challenges that you can solve. Um, I, I guess that typically it starts with an idea that comes out of a challenge that the founder has seen or experienced. Um, uh, I, I think the most important thing is, yeah, you need to know if this, you know, you have to sort of a gut feel first, I guess. He has an idea, I think that could be working. Um, and then how do I make this happen? What do I need? Um, I, we typically encourage people to work with organizations like incubators and accelerators um, that provide an environment where you have other entrepreneurs, um, where you have a little bit of uh, a, a good atmosphere and where you have access to the ecosystem. Because that's, that's important. The connections, as I said earlier, is important. Whether that's the connection to other like-minded entrepreneurs or investors or support organizations. Mm. Yeah. And can you tell us a little bit more about business accelerators? Because some of us may not be familiar with that term and what they do. Yeah, yeah so a business accelerator is, a, uh, op um, is an opportunity for, company, for startups to be accelerated. So that it is a program where the accelerator typically takes a single digit um, equity for a small um, round of capital uh, depends on the accelerator, fifty thousand, hundred thousand, or so, mm. or, or less. Um, uh, with with the idea to really accelerate them up to a level where they can pitch to the next round of investors. Mm. Um, so it's it is it is a program that helps them in the software space. It's typically a lot shorter, um, but also in the hardware. Entrepreneurs, they, they don't tend to be that long, mm -hmm. but it's a, it's a way basically to um, accelerate them to come to a level where they can go to the next level, mm -hmm. or to the next step in, mm -hmm. in their path. Uh, versus an incubator, which um, where you have an idea where you maybe bring in people to sit inside the company to help them. Um, it's like an incubator to bring them um, forward. Mm -hmm. Stepping out of the entrepreneur shoes for a minute and now on the corporate side in Autodesk, yeah. what, are the, what do your clients think of all of this? When they, hey, because I'm an engineer and yeah. I grew up with AutoCAD. Mm. 
Uh, anybody who studied engineering has used AutoCAD at some point in life, right? Yeah. And so it's very, very well known by many, many people. So we have a, a kind of an image about what the company is. Mm. And uh, Jake comes down the lane saying, hey, I got the sustainability stuff, uh, fresh air, clean water. Um, what are the reactions of the clients? What do they think of all of this? Uh, they so, think you're going out of your space mm. or... You mean our core you are, you are customers who are buying your software. Exactly, yeah. Oh, they, I, when they know about this, they are typically surprised. Mm -hmm. the, the first question is, well, why are you doing this? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, unless they have something similar. We also came, I, I came across, across large companies who do something similar, who do invest into startups. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, otherwise, it's the question, is, well, help me explain why you're doing this. Mm -hmm. what, what is that? Um, um, but then you, you start explaining this in a way that I tried today, and, and, uh, and they, they say, well, this is it's interesting. I mean, it actually has a positive feedback. I, I never heard anybody who listened to all this and then said, well, you guys, uh, mm. right? So it, it was always a positive feedback and saying, that's interesting, that's really cool. Mm. Um, and and uh, because it's sort of an unexpected thing, too. Mm. Um, in, I mean, it is an investment for us, right? We have people who spend their time and the resources uh, and then the software and all the other things. Um, for us, it is, it's an interesting opportunity into the window of the next levels and the next generation of innovators, mm -hmm. which is often very different than when you work with a manufacturing company that's 50 years old and has 5,000 people. Mm -hmm. They work very differently, right? Um, and you can see these different methods, the different ways of doing things. That's, that's, that's a learning as well to understand, well, maybe that's the way people will do things in 20 years mm. on a bigger scale than just these little five companies. Mm. Mm. And have any of your clients uh, stepped up and say, hey, I'd like to participate, or that venture's interesting, how do I get involved? Uh, yes, yeah, we had examples of that where we had companies um, where we sort of both invested or you know supported a small startup, we had these uh, examples already, yes. yeah. which is great. That's um, that's a nice way to happen. I mean, that's a different type of connection you suddenly have to a company. Yeah. Um, it it is it, it it's no longer the connection of I have this product and I'm going to buy it. Right? Yeah. It becomes like um, hey, we will support this little company here, and hopefully they become successful because yeah. we both put. A little bit of a stake into it. Yeah, yeah. there's a, an additional shared interest yeah, exactly. and an upside. Yes. Yeah, shared by that. Yeah, that's very interesting. What is Autodesk doing itself in the area of I mean, its own production on sustainability? Your program aside, what's the company doing inside on how it makes its software and its business operations yeah. and how it, who it deals with in business, either as a vendor or as a client? Yeah, so we have since. Um, uh, five, six years uh, now a sustainability report and we report back on all the things that we do as a company program-wise, what the corporate foundation or Auditors Foundation is doing, um, but also what we do within business operations. And, and so that's, you know, as I mentioned earlier, these seven different commitments we have now, uh, a price on carbon, we go renewable energy, we reduce, um, if there's an opportunity, reduce business travel by video conferencing, I mean, these are sort of these things. We also look into our events that we drive. We have every year a big user conference in Las Vegas, and we try to make it carbon uh, low or, or even, carb I mean, as much as effect on the environment as possible. Um, so we pay attention to these things um, because it would be terrible if we wouldn't be. I mean, then everything else starts becoming not solid anymore, it's like you pollute, you know, you throw your bottle behind your back, but they say, hey, can you invest into better bottles, mm -hmm. right? And they, so this, this, this wouldn't work, right? I think we try um, a lot of this, and we also do, so we have a, a manufacturing research facility in San Francisco in one of the piers, um, where we have 3D printers and new manufacturing, advanced manufacturing tools where we study all this. And then we use our own product, uh, our tools to design the space. So we understand what the energy consumption should be. 
Um, we look into our buildings to be LEED certified. So LEED is a, um, a green building certification. Uh, and we have, I think, 22 buildings worldwide that are platinum LEED certified so that they have um, the best energy um, efficiency as, as an office building. Mm. So we try, um, we work on this as well. So that's, it's part of, um, it's an important part of, of our, our, our functioning as well. Mm. And what do the shareholders say? I mean, are some of them subscribers to Friedman and say, hey, what on earth are you doing? That's my money. I want that in dividends, and it's my right in my private capacity to citizen to invest in a green tech fund or support uh, sustainable ventures by direct investment mm -hmm. or giving training courses yeah. and, and that kind of thing. What are the shareholders, or are they saying, hey, you know, that's, we know what that's about. It's really a marketing expense. It's kind of making them look good. Everybody's doing CSR. Everybody's doing something like this. And it's small anyway, but it's, it's kind of off our radar. What are shareholders saying about all this? I, I have not heard any comment in, 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 you know, through the shareholder meetings and the, the, the investors calls and so on where, where people question that. Why are you doing this? I think it's, I believe, I don't know, but I believe it's generally accepted to be uh, an important part of our brand. Um, I don't think people think of it as a marketing activity. Uh, we certainly don't. Um, it's, not, it's not marketing for us. And I don't, I, I don't think that's the case as well. Yeah. Then we should strike while the iron's hot and open yes. it up to questions to our audience because yeah. I think we have a lot of people here who are entrepreneurs, who are building their own ventures, who are actually running their own ventures and would like to learn more about your program. Um, something we were talking about upstairs in the prep room was this whole world of entrepreneurship and venture capital is, is often intimidating. You got this dragon's den image and mm -hmm. the smart talk and the, the, it, there's a whole atmosphere which is kind of off-putting to many people. Yeah. A lot of entrepreneurs say, I'm just a regular guy. I've got an idea. Um, I don't know the smart talk. I'm not particularly articulate, but I think I'd like to make this into a business. And they want to have a window to a more approachable way to starting. And you, you definitely got a nice user interface and uh, you're easy to talk to. So I'd like to open it up to the floor for people who have questions uh, for Jake about his program and maybe how you can uh, get involved and participate. While there's the preg pregnant silence in the room, I think they're, 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 they're thinking about the opportunity that is sitting in front of them that will only be here for another 30 minutes. Um, Japan, incidentally, like yeah, that's right. Japan, incidentally, in the World Entrepreneurship Report, ranks almost at the bottom of, of countries in, across many, many metrics of entrepreneurship, including what is the general impression of entrepreneurs? Is it a reputable uh, profession? Um, uh, ideas of risk and so forth. So um, I, I, entrepreneurs are seen very much as oddball, high risk takers, weirdos uh, in this country. And that's completely different from, I think, the pre-war generation, which were highly entrepreneurial, highly gutsy. Right. Um, you know, they wouldn't dream of spending 40 years working in a big Japanese company. Right. Um, these were the guys who made the big Japanese companies yeah, yeah, that are today, yeah, right? The Hitachis and Sony's and Toshiba's. Uh, they, they, those were made by a, a completely different, highly entrepreneurial uh, generation, which is completely different from what we see here today. And I think one of the hot areas of entrepreneurial people in Japan are women. Uh, this is my personal opinion. One of the reasons why they have no upside from the status quo so they say, well, I might as well make the future myself because I'm not benefiting as a salary man. Even the salary men really aren't benefiting themselves. Um, so a lot of people are really hungry for information on mm, how can I activate my life? Yeah. How can I be happy? Um, how can I create my own future without having to plug myself into the machine? And for so many people, especially women, they're saying, hey, you know what? I think I'd like to build my own business, but I'm not really sure what I can do. Maybe I know soap making or aromatherapy or you know wedding design, whatever it is. So a lot of them are building their ventures and they have them in a slow burn in the background while they keep their day jobs yeah. as office ladies. And they hope that when the revenue meets what they're making yeah. in their day job, they'll yeah. quit the day job and, and go full time. Yeah. So, um, you know, 
those are some of the themes that we're seeing a lot in Japan. Yeah. Um, so with that in mind, questions for, for Jake, please. Yes. Thank you for your presentation and a good dialogue session. And I would like to ask you uh, one or two questions. Sure. Uh, the first one, uh, you mentioned about um, CSR, uh, but um, I think um, your business is uh, really strong, really strongly related to the CSV. Uh, um, um, you uh, create an um, enterprise value, and at the same time, you create a social value. And uh, I think uh, you, your customers are belong to the long, long tail and small business. Uh, but uh, your earning in 2015 uh, about About 2.5 billion. Million. So it's a very huge money, I think. And you are um, uh, um, operating profit is 11 percent. It's a very good uh, point, I think. Uh, uh, the first question is: um, uh, Your business is your business belong to the CSV? Or, and the second question is that your customers, uh, the small, mm. both of them are small business. So uh, CSV as in value, right? That's that's what you mean? Oh, CSV means uh, uh, creating a shared value. Yeah. So, um, so first of all, um, the sustainable, the team that I belong to, right, the sustainability team, uh, we also ensure that our products that are being used by everybody who is using our tools, not just the small companies, has um, sustainable features or features in their tools, in their tool sets, so that enable you to um, to build the right products, the right building. So for us, it's not just a matter of working with small companies. We, we also look into how to make sustainability easy to use, um, you know, affordable and, and uh, insightful as well. So, um, so it, it applies to all of our customers, not just the, the, the small companies. Um, we don't call it CSR. We don't have a CSR department. Um, I guess to some extent I'm part of this, but we don't actually call it that way. Um, and and with the program that 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 I look after, yes, we are looking into small companies only um, because because these companies don't otherwise very often don't have the opportunity. Um, in 2011, I visited a company in Singapore. They made recharging station. Uh, for electric vehicles, uh, and they used cardboard to make the prototype, take a picture of it and fax it to Malaysia. So that was not a very efficient way of, um, of making. Um, and it is, this is just an example, there are many other companies. So the reason why we're doing what we're doing through this program is, is because we, you know, our CEO saw his buddies starting companies and not using, using the right tools because they couldn't afford them. Um, and so that was a way of saying, well, um, you know what, we'll give it to you um, and you can use the right tools and become a better company that way and accelerate your go-to-market that way. Um, so uh, I'm not sure if that's sort of, uh, what was your second question? I forgot. Um, The main customers for our program, the program that I uh, look after, are startups. Startups in the social environmental space. Um, and these ones are hardware startups that have use for Auditor's tools. Um, if they don't have use for our tools, then, then we can't support them. Um, so so that's, that's basically what we do. But, you know, as I've shown, we have 
uh, we've worked with many, many companies of all sizes um, uh, as, a, as a whole, as a company. It, I, I hope I answered your question. Yeah, thank you. Hi, hi, Jake. Uh, yeah. Thank you for your speech today. Um, actually, Mark read my mind uh, when he was, uh, he was starting up, and I thought he was going to finish by asking the question about um, if you're a normal being and uh, you, know, you don't have the network or you just started, um, and how would you go about in that? Um, I guess, because a lot of people say you, you know, starting something, being an entrepreneur is having a passion. You got to have an idea, you have yeah. to have passion. Um, for you, is there uh, some kind of, from seeing all these things, um, some kind of recipe or some kind of, what do you think the whole process is besides, mm. um, is, does that, and does that differ with countries because maybe the cost of failure is uh, lower in some countries or the regulations, um, can you um, give us some insights about that? Yeah, so all the, so all the startups that I, um, that I met and that I talked about the products that they do, without fail, they all have passion for what they do. They 100% believe that what they're doing will change the world. Um, and and I, I guess that's really necessary. I mean, if you do this uh, just to go and try, I, you might be successful, but I think it certainly helps because it puts you on the track of trying to find the right opportunities to move yourself forward. Um, the other thing is some of these uh, entrepreneurs, they just, they had, the in, they had the impression, well, we can. It was not, uh, I, should I or should I not? It was, a lot of them would say, I think I can do this because I can. It, it, it also has sort of a, um, a level of confidence that's, that, that may be also not always you know, maybe it's sort of the reality distortion of Chiefs Jobs type of thing. Um, but, but I think all of them are very, often very positive uh, and passionate about what they're doing and committed. The one thing I would say is, an important thing is they don't just jump right into it. They all think about it, right? They don't give up their day jobs and then say, oh, I'm gonna go and do this. They, to some extent, try what you were just saying, Mark, where they have a day job. And they come to a level where they say, now I have to make a decision. Is that really going to work or not? And of course, there's risk involved because um, not every startup survives. There's, not everyone becomes a unicorn. Um, but I think at that point, you have, they all thought through it. They have a goal that they aim for. They put steps in between to reach that goal, even if the steps will change along the way, but at least they have a path. And it's in the end their passion to say, I'm gonna go and do it. Um, so that's, I'm not sure if that's a recipe for success. I, I think the, the most important thing that I always hear is what I mentioned earlier, have, have good connections. And you don't work in an ivory tower and then one day, decide to leave the tower. You have to be, you know, go to these type of events like this, meet other entrepreneurs, um, go to a maker space and see what they do. Um, get inspired, um, ask them. There's a many, there's a few companies that already, uh, if you go to a maker space, you will find companies already doing this. And that's an opportunity where you say, hey, I'm, would you lend me, I buy you a coffee, or can you lend me 10 minutes? I'll ask you, I'd like to start a business. I think these are sort of the things we have, to, you have to be, outgoing in that sense as well. Um, uh, and, and then it puts you to a point where you say, I think now I'm gonna go and do it. Jake, you said one of the criteria for selecting venture for your program is that they have to be able to use the Autodesk tools. Uh, what if uh, somebody has an idea that doesn't require Autodesk tools but provides a sustainable solution, for example, to one of your clients? Uh, is that something that you would entertain? Uh, so, I mean, our program, the most basic level of entrance is we recognize them uh, as somebody who can use our tools. And, and so the most basic level of entry is um, a set of software tools that they can use. Uh, and if they can't use them, then we probably wouldn't do this. I think there must be, there are probably other ways. I mean, actually, Autodesk also has a, um, a program called Forge, um, you know, like as in forging metal. Um, and that is a software platform 
um, it's, it's a web-based software development platform that also has attached to it a, a, a fund um, to actually invest mm -hmm. into ideas as well. So if it is a software-based solution and startup, that's probably more in that programs field than mm -hmm. in the entrepreneurial impact program because, yeah, I, if you don't know, if you don't have use for our tools, then mm -hmm. you can't even get to step one with mm -hmm. us. Mm -hmm. And that's, yeah, that's not going to work. Other questions? Yeah. Welcome to Tokyo, Mr. Lees. Welcome back. Um, you kind of asked, you kind of answered my question just right then. So I was wondering if there's a financial, what the financial component is for the company is, for example, uh, if you find a startup, for example, that looks very promising, do you guys invest into them ever? And do any of these, ever become, let's say, paying customers, you know, once they make it, quote unquote, make it, do they become subscribers to your software and so on? And I guess that's also kind of like an exit strategy for these uh, entrepreneurs. So please answer as you feel appropriate. I will. <laughs> Any or all those questions. <laughs> yeah, you know, you know me too well. Um, so uh, the couple of points. So, through, so we, we have a corporate foundation that is available, that is out there and can give grants. There's a separate progress, uh, process of due diligence that looks into um, which organization to pick. It's, to our knowledge, it's the only foundation who actually supports individuals and organizations that use design to create a positive impact. Um, I didn't count all of the grantees that I showed on the slides. I think it's over 30 now that are uh, supported um, with, with the, 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 the Autodesk Foundation. Um, Proximity Design, DREF, Mass Design Group are all um, foundation um, customers. Uh, and BioLite as well, um, who went through our program first and then um, are also supported through the foundation. So um, if we don't currently don't take equity um, into these organizations. We don't have, um, at this point, a, a program of either impact investments or, or accelerator or, 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 or any, any sorts like this. Um, if it does, you know, if there should be the, a strategic match, um, of course we have a corporate development arm. Um, we have the, uh, the, the Forge Fund that I mentioned earlier. Um, uh, sorry, what was the last thing that you asked? I forgot. Uh, oh, and, and are they becoming customers? Yes, some of them are, yes. Actually, the, one of the very first companies that joined this program, it had a different name. It actually was once the clean tech program because we only focus on clean technologies. Um, it's Tesla. And, and so, I mean, we don't say that, I mean, we played a role, but I'm for sure enough, um, they've done everything else right. Um, but they were one of our very first ones in 2009, I believe, um, to join the program and to be supported with software. Um, uh, I'd like to see a lot more of these type of uh, successes. Um, but yeah, there are examples of companies after three, four years and come back and say, I need two more seats and I can buy them because now I have funds. Um, that's sort of, that's nice, right? I mean, if we do everything right, they, they like us and they like our tools. And if you, have, if you continue to provide the right tools, they will come back eventually if they're commercially successful and, and, and hopefully stay a customer with us. Um, we don't make that a condition, um, but we hope so. so um. Where do you see this program in three years? I see this program, I, I think there is First of all, there's two, two points to this question. One, I believe we will truly be go global. Um, I mean, we, we are already global. We already have applications from Africa, but um, I believe in terms of global, I think we will have a much bigger uh, presence, mm -hmm. hopefully. Uh, and I believe we will also be able to structure it more potentially like an accelerator or like an incubator or something in between that also has another financial aspect to this. Mm -hmm. Do you see uh, raising your own capital as part of that story or partnering with an existing VC? 
that's I, I'm still we're still thinking of I think that's the, that's a little bit too early to do. But um, I mean, if you look at uh, the Forge Development Fund, is is that's ten million dollars. Um, so uh, I think that there is a possibility. I mean, I I don't know. We, there's a couple of possibilities on how we would want to set this up. Um, and either one is a possibility. Um, you know, I, I would say the other thing I'd like to say is currently what we're doing is we're looking really for organizations that are um, working with entrepreneurs um, and, and do collaborate with them and have an agreement with them um, where they already have a path um, that leads a startup from from seed to IPO. There are a few of them. Um, some of them are um, active, very active, not just in one country, but in several countries. And that's sort of an interesting partner to work with. If we have an opportunity with that, maybe then that's all not necessary. Maybe it's just enough to be working with some of these in influential and influential in the sense that they're very impactful mm. players and partner with them. That, that could be another way of doing this. Mm. Yeah. What's success? A, a sustainability from an economic standpoint, I think we understand, but yeah. from a program standpoint, I guess it, you have to reach a certain level of sustainability that it should be able to continue when you go away. Mm. Long after Autodesk passes into history, perhaps 500 years from now, <laughs> but uh, what is success? Uh, I also have two, two, answers, two, two parts to my answer to this. One, I believe once sustain, sustainability as a term disappears, just like organic description of food disappears, I think then that's part of success. When it becomes an implicit thing that what we do creates a better world mm -hmm. and gives back more than it takes. Um, that's one thing. And the other thing is I believe that um, there is an opportunity for companies like Autodesk and others to, to really work with startups a, a lot more than we all currently do. Mm. Um, I, and I believe that's, that's also a model forward for many of the bigger companies. Outsource your disruption, make it become part of the community and be recognized of being as a community shareholder, stakeholder, mm -hmm. and not just somebody who sells stuff. I mm -hmm. think that's, that is going to change tremendously. And I think that would be success in, this, in a way that you see other companies and say, we'll, we'll, we'll invest here and we'll mm -hmm. want to make this community. And if it has a, an advantage for us as a company, then great. And mm -hmm. if somebody goes bust, well, at least we tried. Mm -hmm. So I think that's, that is what I believe is uh, the other sign of success. Mm -hmm. Jake, we're coming to the top of the hour and our, our time is drawing to an end, but before you go, um, you said you haven't started a venture yet, but obviously you've been bitten by the entrepreneurial bug. It'd be hard not to because you're talking to all these entrepreneurs. Will you share us just behind closed doors and you can edit this part Switch out of the video. Switch off the camera. Switch <laughs> off the camera so your boss isn't here. Oh, when are you going to build your own venture and what is it going to be? You know what? I'm so tempted to say it's going to be beautiful and huge, um, which somebody else, I'm quoting somebody else there. Uh, now, um, I, I do receive a lot of questions from entrepreneurs and say, hey, you're doing work with us. You know us. We know you. Um, how about you? we'll offer you an equity stake? Uh, and I think that is... Um, the, the challenge with that is, is it's, it's somewhat outside of your core business as, as a company. And it requires a lot more. But I, I would think that I would love to see a, a vehicle of sorts that's, that has a very specific focus on these companies that, that really bring us to a better future. Um, and, and I, you know, I don't know if that sounds so great, but I really fully believe in that. I, I think there are, I mean, I've seen these companies who are very passionate about a positive impact and leaving a legacy and being able to be part of this and actually really help them to, uh, 
to be more than just, hey, here's a tool, but actually go and really walk with them to the goal line. I think that's, that would be my idea. That's great. Yeah. Jake, I know you're really busy, a man, and you flew in right off the plane and you joined us. Thanks for stopping by Globus tonight and, and sharing your thoughts with us. Thank and you. Uh, we yeah. look forward to having you back again soon. Let's show our appreciation, Jake, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.